some questions. What is the refractive error? What are the K readings? Uh, what's the cornea thickness at the thinnest location? And uh, what is the uh, keratoconus level and pattern? Regarding the refractive error, um, logically, if we have uh, a small refractive error, we will have good results with uh, rings. And when we have good, uh, best correct visual acuity, uh, we will end up with good results, better results, even uh, if uh, refractive error is uh, bigger. Uh, so uh, the optimal results can be achieved uh, when we have a spherical equivalent of less than minus 6, and with the best corrected visual acuity is accepted. Now, regarding the K-readings, of course, when we have K-reading um, uh, in the uh, maximal uh, part of the cornea, uh, uh, like this one, 47, um, uh, results will be uh, better, much better, than if we have such a cornea. Uh, the optimal results will be achieved when we have between 50 and 55 uh, K readings. Now, what about the corneal thickness? Of course, when we have such a cornea, we shouldn't touch it with intracorneal rings, um, and the results will be in such a cornea much better. So the thinnest location, which, uh, w uh, when it is between 350 and 550, is optimal. Why less than this? Because it is uh, uh, better to do uh, dark. While uh, uh, more than this, also, the response of the cornea towards the intracorneal rings, also, it's not uh, good because of the high viscous diseased tissue. The keratoconus level, of course, when we have low level, it's, uh, the results will be better. Now, I'd like to, do, uh, to, to say something about the patterns of the cornea. I have my own new classification of uh, the uh, uh, curvature maps. Now, uh, pattern number one, when we have uh, uh, this pattern with straight central segment. Number two, when we have it the same, but with skewed. Now, number three, when we have symmetric bowtie tie with straight line inside. The same, symmetric but I, but with skew. Number five, pellucid-like with straight. Number six, pellucid-like with skew. Number seven is the eccentric cone. Now, from my experience, results will be much better when we have straight better than skew. And when we have asymmetric but I, results will be better than the symmetric bow tie. But in pellucid like and eccentric cone, uh, the results will be unpredictable. Upon decision, we have to consider the refractive error, the K readings at the cone apex and the cone itself, location of the cone and the axis. Considering the refractive error, now, uh, we have to look at the topographical astigmatism and the manifest astigmatism. We are working in the cornea, and we are changing the anterior surface of the cornea, so we have to consider the astigmatism, the topographical astigmatism, the amount. I'm not talking about the axis, the amount of astigmatism. So what I do is uh, I always uh, take the uh, uh, topographical uh, astigmatism and the, the uh, manifest sphere, of course. Now, when we, when we have uh, these two corneas with the same refractive error, with the same pattern. Uh, if you go to the nomogram uh, of the companies, uh, you will find that uh, the same segment, they will put maybe uh, 160, uh, 200 microns for both. But uh, this is not uh, logic because uh, we have uh, K readings different. So uh, what I do is I add something to the sphere according to the K reading. Uh, why? Because we are pushing the cone towards the center, except in the pellucid like uh, pattern because after the rings, and after the improvement, uh, still the cone peripheral. Now, uh, choosing the axis. There are many uh, theories about that. Uh, some uh, uh, some uh, uh, is speaking about uh, uh, clinical axis, others about the topographical axis, others about the comma axis, uh, with uh, some guidelines from the uh, nomograms. But what I do is, a modified axis. I use three up, up. What I do is 
I, I do a tangent. I make uh, this uh, uh, big picture of the uh, curvature map without anything, uh, without numbers, without segments. And I do a draw, uh, a tangent to the shape of the, co of the cone. And uh, then I, I uh, use this uh, axis. And I have uh, good results. And I presented uh, such a study in uh, some conferences. This is one of the cases, free up, cost up, and this is the reference. Now, with the critical axis, we, we don't have uh, uh, predictable results. Uh, look at this case. Uh, we are supposed to, to put the ring here. Okay. Now, what I did is I put only one segment here. This was the pre-op. This is post-op, only one segment. We have overcorrection. Overcorrection now. Okay. The Pilsed marginal generation, we have some concepts here. We have to be aware of the thickness, the corneal thickness when we put when we want to put the, thick, the, the segment. Uh, what we do is we, we measure uh, where we are going to uh, uh, insert, uh, to begin our incision, and we take 80% uh, of it. But this is wrong in pellucid marginal degeneration. Why? Because look at the thinnest location. It is inferiorly displaced, and it will be at the passage of the uh, segment, and uh, you will end up with a penetration. Like in this case, if you want to calculate uh, the entrance, it will be like this, but the thinnest location is less, so we will end up with penetration here, especially if we are doing femtosecond. Dr. Mazin, two minutes to go. Okay. The cone location, uh, we have to be aware of the cone location, but we, do not, we, don't, um, we must not uh, rely on the uh, topography itself. We have to, to uh, look at the uh, slit lamp also. Why? Look, here it is central. Now, the slit lamp view, no, it is inferior. This is pellucid marginal generation indeed. Uh, sometimes uh, it gives us the opposite. This is pellucid like general degeneration, but the cone on the topography is inferiorly displaced, while this is the shine flow on the vertical cut, uh, the vertical uh, uh, cross section, and uh, uh, it is not 